Okay, we are recording here Tuesday morning, April 9th, and a happy Tuesday it is. Not just because the Patriots offseason program finally underway, and Matt Judon, Christian Gonzalez, Kendrick Bourne, Ramondre Stevenson, Devon Godchow, Jabril Peppers, Hunter Henry, among others, are all in the building for this voluntary portion. But the Red Sox home opener is today, 2.30, first pitch against the Orioles. Looking forward to watching and probably listening to a little bit more of that. Uh, got quick slants tonight with our guy Tommy Curran. But also, in case you missed it, just about 12 hours ago, you comments basketball team, national champions once again. Now, I promise, I'm going to be on my best behavior here today. That is the last mention that you will hear of me, partly because the folks on YouTube have to stare at my uh, large UConn hat, which is atop my extremely large head. Generally not a good combination for those of us in the seven and a half and above hats, uh, but I got to rock something today, and this is probably the last base I can be where I can wear a hat. Uh, with availability coming up, we're talking to Drupal Peppers, Hunter Henry, uh, and then, as I mentioned, going on TV a little bit later. So, in the meantime, we have a solo episode today. I haven't done this in a while, just you and I hanging out. But here's the plan. We are going to review the Kyle Duggar contract. He's back. Four-year deal, $58 million. I have some fresh nuggets here for you exclusively on that. We're going to go into why I'm all in. Ten toes. Fully submerged, whatever you want to call it, on Drake May for the Patriots at number three, and then get to your mailbag questions. But starting with Kyle Duggar, uh, I said on the radio yesterday, yeah, yesterday morning, these early hits uh, tend to kind of blow your memory a little bit, <clears throat> as well as the, I'm not going to say it, basketball game. Uh, anyway, I gave this deal a C plus. Four years, $58 million, $32.5 million guaranteed, with a maximum value of $66 million. And the main reason you stray away from, oh, this is an A-plus deal, this is a great piece of team business, is the fact that Kyle Duggar's new contract makes him the sixth highest paid safety in the league by total value and by average annual value. So he's getting $14.5 million uh, per year here. He is also now the fifth highest paid safety in the league by total guarantees. Again, $32.5 million, no matter what happens, here you go, lock it in, put it in the bank, keep it there, do whatever you want with it. And the goal here seemed to be in the contract negotiations after the Patriots applied the transition tax, which remember happened last month, one year, $13.8 million guaranteed, which then transition tag is the average of the top 10 highest paid players in your position. Again, for safeties, it's 13.8. It's much higher for other positions. Franchise tag is different in that it's the top five players, but you, you know, if you're the team, get yourself a chance to uh, get some compensation in case that player goes and negotiates and signs a contract elsewhere. The Patriots said, we don't need it. We'll slap the transition tag. And it worked. Now, it worked because they pushed out all of the other bidders off of the table. And I mentioned the Booter Baker deal. We're going to get to that in a second. Um, but Kyle Duggar did not receive any other formal, formal offers when he received the transition tag. There was interest from other teams. As we've talked about before, there was a flood of safeties, starting safeties who were cut in the days after the transition tag, which flooded the market. So the demand for Kyle Duggar went down as the supply of other safeties went up. And a lot of those safeties signed deals that were really maybe half or at least 75% of what the market projected because, again, they're everywhere. Teams don't have to negotiate on your terms. We'll pick the one that we want, bring him in, and that's that. So Kyle Duggar doesn't have another offer. His leverage seemingly is gone. But the Patriots were already on the record saying he's a core player. We want to bring our core players back. We want to extend them. Oh, and they're also on the record. This is publicly available information, shout out over the cap, is still leading the league in cap space when they entered for agency number two. They also lead the league in cap space as it stands now, April 9th, in 2025 and in 2026. And they have zero dollars committed in 2027. So Kyle Duggar's leverage might not be from the outside, but it's a fact of, look, this is a PR thing. You guys are taking hits left and right. I'm one of your best players. I want to come back. I just want to fail. And the expectation from Duggar's camp along was somewhere between 12 to $16 million annually. I reported this with Doug Kai back at the combine. You can listen back to it, find it, read it. It's there. So when he lands, at $14.5 million annually. Uh, granted, I was a little surprised because, again, things were not great. He was dissatisfied, as I wrote a couple weekends ago, Kyle Duggar was, still with the transition tag, something he never signed. But here they kind of met in the middle because he understood going into the voluntary offseason program. You want your players in. You want the captains. You want to set this new culture. The Patriots obviously wanted him. And they believed he can play with Jabril Peppers, which is really the only on-field issue here, right? They're both box safeties. You know, Peppers has played free safety before, did it in college, a little bit in Cleveland, 
Duggar's not going to live there. He might vacation. He may take a long weekend if he's safe. But you do not want him living on the block because it's just not going to go well. So they finally kind of come to the middle. This is the market set by Grant Delpit, who signed with the Browns just over a year ago for $12 million annually. Uh, $16 million went to Jesse Bates. Kyle Duggar, not as good as Jesse Bates. We all get that. I was surprised, though, that this ended up a little closer to Jesse Bates than Grant Delpit because of the lack of offers, the way the Patriots boxed out the market. And again, Kyle Duggar, 28-year-old player, like you're not going to ink him to a significantly long-term contract. Understanding his prime is probably this year and next. And that's it. And that's just that's just the skill set, right? Like there are only so many depth of courties that could run 4-4 almost into their 40s. Now, Buda Baker, I wrote over the summer, uh, geez, this is eight, nine months ago now, looking at possible extensions for Duggar, Uche, Matt Judon. The Judon one, I overshot. The Uche one, I overshot wildly, uh, though we underperformed. But the Duggar one, I will tell you, I hit on the head. And I had projected a three-year $43.5 million contract with $24 million guaranteed as a projection because I saw Buda Baker's deal as the framework. Kyle Duggar and Buda Baker are aligned in a lot of different categories. Former second round picks, box safeties, similar productions in terms of traditional stats, interceptions, tackles, sacks, forced fumbles. And Buda Baker signed his deal four years, $59 million in 2020. So you account for a little bit of inflation. Kyle Duggar gets a higher average annual value. He gets a little bit more guarantees. And those are all on the head for my projection over the summer and where they ended up over the weekend, which is to say, I'm very happy Kyle Duggar got his money. I'm happy the Patriots lived up to their word. But if you're looking at this deal, even as someone who projected this over the summer, because back then, let's be honest, Kyle, St Kyle Duggar's stock was higher than it was now. He had a dip. He might have set career highs in tackles and in sacks and started every single game. But he was not strong in coverage. He did not have the same playmaking in terms of past deflections and interceptions as he did in 2022. So his stock goes down. He's a year older. Oh, and the market is flooded with safeties. I didn't think he would get the contract that I projected and made sense all along based on things that teams build these contracts around. Again, your original draft status, traditional production, and where you are in the market relative to recent contracts and who's currently available. He was available to everyone and no one else made an offer, but they landed here. So that's why I say... All right, set a C plus, and I'll pivot now to a B minus because here's the last part. You have heard and probably said and maybe seen people complain about the Patriots not spending money. I think they should have spent money. I would have traded for a luxurious need for a 2025 third round pick and a contract that was basically $20 million per year. Didn't happen. But what they did do in an area where I think you can afford to spend a little bit more is pay Kyle Duggar, overpay Kyle Duggar just to get him back. And if you're going to overspend, spend it on a known commodity, spend it on a good locker room player, spend it on a player who is in his prime. Again, this is a four year deal. You can always typically lop off like an extra year or two at the end of it because the money's not guaranteed. I don't have the full details, but the bottom line here is in a vacuum, this is not a good deal for the Patriots. But zooming out, understanding where they are at the start of a new era, understanding how much money they had to spend, and understanding where we were in the summer going like, this deal makes sense. Let's all make it happen. And Kyle expected to play better and expected to get more money. It didn't happen. They landed in the same place that made sense all along. So good for them. Again, it's not going to be an A because an A is for team-friendly deals, which we gave out plenty of those. And I said, as far as the Patriots free agency went, hit a lot of singles, did all your homework, came to the big final exam. You slept through it. So even if you get an A on the Josh Uche deal and Anthony Jennings and uh, Kendrick Bourne and all these different contracts that they signed, Mike Unwinu, you, you can't get an A on the course, their overall for agency grade, if you just sleep through the final exam. Kyle Duggar, like the overall grade, B minus C plus is what I assess for their for agency, fits right in line with there. You kind of missed your window, but you kept him here. You overpaid a little bit. He's a good player. You need more of those. That's where we leave this. Okay, so I know we talk a lot about the draft in this podcast. It's a football podcast. It's a Patriots podcast. What else are we going to do until April 25th? Well, let me tell you, soon enough, we are going to turn our attention to the Celtics and Bruins because they're getting in on the playoff action. And so can you with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app, where right now you can win up to 100 times your money with as few as four correct picks with basketball, 
hockey, and other sports on Price Picks. And I'll tell you, look, I like Price Picks for baseball too. The Red Sox just started up. They're playing the Mariners, the A's. I put a little money down and I got a lot more money back. So download the app today and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to 100 bucks. I did the same. Again, download the app today. Use code CLNS at Price Picks for a first deposit match up to $100 and you can do the same. Basketball, hockey, and baseball. We got a lot to do until the draft and you can find it all at Price Picks. Okay, on to what I believe to be a great prospect and potentially a great player, Drake May. I have an extensive article on the thebostonherald.com in the Boston Herald today saying everything I want to say about Drake May, but I, I deserve to give it to you here in the podcast and those listening. Thank you as always for watching um, because it, it, there, there are parts of this that I think are better expressed in this kind of format, in this medium, than me just writing and trying to find the word, right words and not repeat the same words to describe a dude who you just watch and go, he could play quarterback for any team in any offense in any era. Drake May is a timeless prospect, okay? That does not mean he's guaranteed to hit. Again, you heard me say this. There are no guarantees. If you want guarantees, don't watch the NFL draft. If all the world's a stage, all the drafts a casino. It's risk, it's reward, hits and misses. Quarterbacks at the top of the draft, we know more likely than not, will bust out. But if I'm placing a bet on a particular player in this draft, who's not going to be Caleb Williams because he's gone to Chicago, but we obviously all know Washington will get their pick at number two, I'm betting on Drake May. It's not to diminish Jane Daniels, who I think the Patriots should draft at number three, if May goes second. Run to the podium, hand in the card. I'm on the record. I like Jane Daniels. Pick him if he's available. But I love Drake May. Let's get to the timeless part. Six foot four, 223 pounds. All of the arm talent in the world. He's accurate. He's tough. He's decisive. He protects the ball. He's 1.8% turnover worthy play percentage. Shout out Pro Football Focus. Would have been tied for best in the NFL last year among starting quarterbacks. So when you read scouting reports to go, he's a little reckless with the ball. He's over aggressive. Look to see what the stats say. Because, yes, the 16 interceptions over his two years as a starter, another plus, sample size, experience, snaps, reps, all those different things, uh, not great. No one wants to see 16 interceptions and average eight per year in a 12-game season at the college level. But a few of those, starting with one of the first he threw in the opener against South Carolina last year, literally went through two hands of his intended target and landed with the defense, not on him. So the plays when he was uh, really risking the ball, that were worthy of a turnover, whether they were dropped interceptions or real ones, was 1.8%. Again, tied for best in the league if he was in the NFL last year. Obviously, it'll be up wherever he lands and plays next season. But that combination of protecting the ball, throwing it all over the yard, being big, strong, fast, accurate, tough, and decisive, that wins. That matters. That lasts. Okay? That works. He's, uh, at, you know, basically, if you heard any of that, can draw the comparison that everyone's drawn. I'm going to do now. He's cut from the same prototypical cloth as Justin Herbert and Josh Allen. Again, big, strong arm dudes who as prospects came out with questions about their consistency. Totally legitimate. I, I was actually out on Justin Herbert, and I remember talking to Doug, uh, Kai, my, my colleague at the Herald, about this thing. Like, I think he's getting the bump. We've talked about this before. You look the part. People are going to give you the benefit of the doubt. And I just... I want something deeper. I want something more consistent. He was terrible in his last game against Wisconsin. They were playing in the Rose Bowl. I'm like, that dude is, is going to go and suddenly carve up an NFL defense. But here's the thing. It's not only that he's cut from that cloth, which worked, and I was wrong about Herbert. But the questions about consistency, in my opinion, stem a lot from the supporting cast. And this is the question as it relates to me. How much of the drop-off in his strat statistical production and the quality of his film from last season, 2023, dropping down from 2022, is a result of that supporting cast. And additionally, how much did his supporting cast, with one of the worst offensive lines as far as pass protection goes in the ACC in larger college football and a lesser receiving core, motivate him to overcompensate with more dangerous play? I have to do more. I have to put on the Superman cape. No one else is going to do this. I need to. You see with Josh Allen, right? Like those are his worst plays. The comp fits on multiple levels here. But there are some stable metrics from year to year, even though, again, the statistical production was better in 2022. The tape is a little bit better, in my opinion. When you dive a little bit deeper, a lot of this is courtesy of PFF. His adjusted completion percentage, basically just accuracy. Take away the throwaways, no spikes, 
no drops. How often did you put the ball where he wanted? 75.4% in 2022, 75.2%, excuse me, 3% in 2023. So a difference of 0.1% as far as accuracy goes. His grade on standard dropbacks, okay, so no play action, no RPOs, no rollouts, no scramble drills, no cheap, you know, atypical plays, not atypical as unusual, but like a smaller percentage of the throws you're going to make versus dropping back and I need to throw the ball. Well above 90. Passing grade uh, without pressure. Well above 90. This is on a scale of 100 over at PFF. And if you don't like PFF, that's fine. We're going to get into some better stats, including, uh, well, maybe not better stats, but more traditional ones, passer rating in a second. But his protection of the ball, again, 1.8% last year. Very similar to his first season as a starter in 2022 as a redshirt freshman, just 2.2%. So even when things are going great, as they were back then, or less than that, as they were in the second half of last season for North Carolina and Drake May, he still holds on and protects to the ball. So he can win from the pocket. Again, traditional passing grade, regular dropbacks, he can win without pressure. And that is the number one prerequisite for elite quarterback play. Accuracy, decision-making, and winning from the pocket. And there's the bonus. Um, Drake May is also the best over the middle of the field, which is a huge battleground in the NFL. It's where... The defense is most often, it's crowded. There's a lot of traffic. Not just, even if you're running inbreakers, linebackers, safety, slot corners are over there. It's the easiest place for defenses to disguise, making it more likely for quarterbacks to make a mistake. And you need some velocity, which we talk about arm talent. It can mean a lot of different things, right? How far you can throw the ball, the touch that you put on the ball, you know, the knowledge of when I need to rip this into a tight window. Is it a line drive throw? Does it have a little bit of an arc, a lot of an arc? Drake May can do all of that. So let's not skip over that part. But over the middle of the field, specifically, you need to put a zip on that, let's be honest, you and I and anyone else watching the Patriots have really not seen since 2018. Like last year, Tom Brady, he still had it, but he wasn't making those throws as often. Let's 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 give Brady the 2019, okay? Wasn't happy with Cam Newton. Mac Jones never had it. Drake May's got it all. So when he's ripping these throws or firing them into windows over the middle of the field, Here's passer rating for you. On deep throws over the middle last season, his passer rating was 117.2. On intermediate throws, it was 116.1. And over the short middle, it was just 106.4. Not, not a huge deal, just 106.4. Uh, but his completion percentage over the short middle was 83.3%. So he wins in the most important area. He wins from the pocket. And his pocket presence, to be fair, his response to pressure, how he relates to danger, which is not a stable or sticky stat. We talked a ton about that with Mac Jones, and it's not predictive year to year. It's not necessarily predictive game to game when you go back and look at quarterback performance under pressure. But the best I can tell, having watched every single snap of Drake May from last year, his pocket presence wore down, which spoke to a distrust of the offensive line. And you know what this looks like, having watched Mac Jones, who stood there in the earlier part of last season, and by game four, it was like, F it. I can't do this. Like The pressure is getting to me. This is an issue. And he was right. It still broke him. And that's what matters. But Drake May waited virtually all of this season before going, okay, I'm, I'm getting a little skittish here. And people pinpoint to those last final games against Clemson and North Carolina saying, oh, he finally faced a good defense. First of all, that's not true. And look what happened. His pocket presence did wane. It wasn't as good as it was at the beginning of the season or in 2022. But overall... It did improve from year one to year two. And as best I can tell, a lot of that had to do with the scheme. And you can tell it's scheme, which might be on Drake May for failing to, to recognize certain blitzers, though we saw examples of this, and I'll get to that in a second, is the number of free runners he had at him, unblocked pass rushers or blitzers. And they had a new offensive coordinator in addition to all of this uh, you know, raw offensive line talent in North Carolina. It's Chip Lindsey, comes from a pro-style system. What they tried to do is mesh the spread offense they were running in 2022. Had a lot of success, all the passing concepts, with what Lindsey knew on the ground and in the offensive line. It didn't work, okay? It's all shotgun, pistol sets, a lot of empty sets, not many answers in protection. So teams that got creative with the blitz, Miami, NC State, Clemson, gave them problems. But there is an example. Even in that NC State game, Drake May's worst tape, Merrill Hodge, very <laughs> eager to point out when he argues that Drake May is a guy who will get you fired. Don't agree. People disagree. It's draft season. It happens all the time. Nate Tice tweeted a clip of this from The Athletic or Yahoo Sports. Excuse me. Actually, he does both. Good for Nate. 
where he identified an incoming blitz, checks to a rollout pass, and throws a touchdown. He's also thrown a left-handed touchdown, by the way. Watch the pit game, which does not start well. Another team that got creative with the blitz, but North Carolina solved it and absolutely steamrolled them. So the point is, in those games, not only were teams creative, but NC State specifically said, we're going to send five, which means we're going to get one-on-ones against all of your offensive linemen, and one of them is going to break. That is A, we're better than you, and we know it up front game plan. And when you put a creative spin on it, there's not a whole lot quarterbacks can do. And you might be thinking, okay, Kelly, this is enough. Like, Drake, man, just screwed up. You sound like an apologist. That's fair. And we're going to get to the downsides. Um, I, I don't think it's entirely fair because, again, there are examples when he had the tools to change the protections, change the plays, call out certain blitzers, not to mention he'll hang in and keep his eyes downfield, that he could do this. I think he just needs more answers in the system and more time in a system that doesn't have him basically standing alone in shotgun all of the time. Three more things, then we'll get to the downside. Drake May also played faster despite this pressure, which can induce you either to get the ball out quickly or more often in his instance, try to extend plays and try to create, again, throwing on the Superman cape. He played faster than Jaden Daniels and Caleb Williams. Average snap to throw time was about 2.7 seconds. Now that's slower than most starting NFL quarterbacks, but it's faster than Daniels and Williams. So when he needs to speed up, but still be on time and process faster, I think he can do it because evidence of the last two years, both instances when he was forced to and when it was by play design. So he's playing faster. He's used to this in NFL speed, NFL rhythm, playmaking. I mentioned extending plays. Drake May does not just run to run, to scramble. He runs to extend plays as a passer. He always has his eyes downfield. This ties into the pocket presence. It also ties into the playmaking, which is a modern requirement for elite quarterback plays. I wrote this in in the story. Quarterbacks are no longer, you know, classically trained musicians. Play the notes, do it exactly, be on time, and fit within this larger orchestra or operation. You need a little bit of jazz to you. You need a classically trained jazz performer where you could play the notes, But you also need to listen to your own improvisational genius, your inner muse, and know when to go off and scat a little bit, okay? Now, that's as far as I'm going to go with the music metaphor because I do not play any kind of instruments. But you get the point. There needs to be something where you can create, where people listen or see and watch and go, that's different. That's spectacular. That's special. Drake May can do this. Again, Jaden Daniels runs to run. He wants to scramble. That dude's got 4-4 speed. God bless you. Run to the end zone every single time if you can. But... Drake May is scrambling to throw and run, and he's devastating on third down. So he's got the playmaking. He's strong. He's looking downfield, but we'll go get those yards when he needs to. Last thing. Um, well, that was really actually about it. So we're just going to summarize. <laughs> he can win from the pocket. He can win outside of structure. He makes every single throw. There's evidence of a high football IQ, something backed up by executives from multiple teams that I talked to and said he was at least tied for, at worst, most impressive interview with the combine. Talking about coming out of the room, X's and O's and his old tape. And so when you look at all the great quarterbacks, Mahomes, Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson, okay, Dak Prescott to a degree, um, Justin Herbert, Matthew Stafford can do this. You need to be a master inside the pocket and be able to play a little bit of jazz on the outside to improvise. Drake May does all of this. And when you look at some of the downsides we're about to hit here, I think a lot of them stem from the supporting cast. Not all of them. His footwork super sloppy. But this is a guy with rare traits, a modern skill set, and a timeless profile. It wins. It's always won. And it will, again, if you take Drake May and can support him and teach him when to play the music on the sheet or when to let it loose and create on his own. It's a very fine balance. But those guys I just mentioned, Mahomes, Allen, et cetera, have mastered it. Okay, downsides. Uh, Drake May is super aggressive. (laughs) There is a downfield throw. He will take it virtually every single time. Like, he is aggressive in the way that you're reaching for your pepper spray if he's sitting on you at the bar. But thankfully, aggressive in the NFL means more touchdowns um, than anything else. So you don't like that always. Again, Josh Allen is a very good comp in a lot of different levels because you'll miss the easy play. You'll take unnecessary hits. You can stay on schedule as opposed to getting on highlight reels, and that's important over the long term. It's more sustainable way to play offense. And where you see this show up negatively for Drake May, is an 18.8% pressure to sack rate. This is a sticky stat. This, unlike your reaction to pressure, is more predictive game to game and year to year. For example, 
Drake May, uh, 18.2% as a redshirt freshman in 2022, 18.8% last year as a redshirt sophomore. And what you really want for starting quarterbacks, and this has you know, become a, a popular stat to talk about in this draft cycle, is to be in the mid-teens, right? Like J.J. McCarthy is lower around the 16%, ideally a tick lower than that. Jane Daniels and Caleb Williams are much higher than Drake May. But 18.8% is still too high. Because the simplest way to think about this is, is this. When you're in danger and things go bad, how often do you let them or force them to become worse? Can you get a throwaway for zero yards? Or are you taking an eight or sack? Can you keep a drive alive? And when you were taking the sack, nuking the drive, basically, um, one out of five times, that's unsustainable. But you get that closer to one out of seven, one out of eight, you can live with that, okay? How do you respond to pressure? What do you do in those situations? Do you make it worse? Do you keep it as is? Or can you create? We've already established with Drake May, who has these preposterous throws, even in that NC State team, <laughs> right foot, 40 yards away, flicks his wrist, and throws an absolute bomb to the front right corner. Like, he can do that. Did it against Clemson, too. That actually might be the Clemson play I'm referring to. But they're all over the pit tape. South Carolina, rifling throws against Miami. Same deal. Okay, he can do all that stuff. But you still need a floor when you're pressured. And right now, it's a little bit too low. He also misses on some underneath throws. And the, the most common issues for him are he's behind on in-breaking routes and a little too far ahead on outbreakers. He does get sped up sometimes when this happens, which is a reaction to the pressure. It's not always tied, though, to bad mechanics where you could look at his footwork, which, again, we'll get to in a second, uh, is a little bit of a mess because he's a dude who knows he can get away with it and still rip that throw in. Now, it's a little too uh, consistent, these misses, within zero to nine yards from line of scrimmage. So this might just be a bug in his system, in his game. Or there's something that can be ironed out with better reps, better quarterbacks, coaches, uh, which, you know, I'll say this in a bit. The best course of action to me, I think the Patriots take him, sit him for most, if not all of his rookie season. You get this stuff ironed out. We just checked off or scratched off one of his very few weaknesses. Now, look, again, I talked about a few years ago, talking with Doug about Justin Herbert. I don't see it. If I was listening to myself down four years ago, I'd be like, okay, so you want to trust a guy who's missing fastballs down the middle because he just looks good in the box? Like, why, why am I going to get – all excited about these rare instances of playmaking. If he just can't do the simple thing and put the bat on the ball, can't complete, you know, slants as often as everybody else or out routes, whatever it might be. Here's the thing. If you miss on an extra couple of fastballs or a slant or an out route, but you can drill, absolutely crush sinkers, splitters, and sliders at the knees on the edge of the box for doubles and home runs, uh, a much rarer, more valuable skill set, particularly against elite competition, you got to take that every time. The upside is worth the occasional slap on the forehead dope moment. Drake May has too many dope moments. Don't get me wrong. But I think the upside here outweighs those significantly. Uh, footwork, last thing. It, it's it's just all over the place. Um, and this is sometimes overstriding, sometimes opening up a little bit too much. You know, you want your foot generally, your front foot pointed uh, just to the left or just ahead of where your your target is. Again, you're trying to lead them in stride. His front foot is 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 everywhere. Again, this can be fixed. He's only 21, but as it stands now, when you look at the easy misses underneath, the footwork, sometimes responses to pressure and the pressure to sack rate, these are the downsides. But that's it. I see a lot of fixable stuff here for Drake May. So if you couldn't tell already, or if you missed me saying this, what feels now like 18 minutes ago, I am all in on this kid. I've been watching for a while. We waited to drop these breakdowns because Doug had an excellent deep dive into Jaden Daniels on Monday for the Boston Herald. And he'll be on later to talk about Jaden um, because it's closer to the draft. Like we just had a very dead first week of April after the owners meeting. We wait. Here's all the information. I'm glad I did because the more I watched, the more I fell in love. And there is some ugly tape and there is no guarantee. And if you want to call him a boomer bust prospect, I'm going to disagree a little bit because I don't think it's a 50-50 proposition. I think he's more likely to hit. Um, but again, all the drafts of the casino, it's risk and reward. There are hits and misses. Drake May, though, is someone I want to bet on because of the return, because of what he's shown me, the two-year sample as a starter, the things that are issues I think can be fixed. This is a guy you want to win games with. You can win games with. You can win championships with if he continues to develop the way that he has already. Okay, mailbag. I'm going to try to breeze through this. we got to get down to Gillette and talk to Hunter Henry and Jabril Peppers. Uh, Fuad, quote, boring question, apologies. 
<laughs> First of all, no need to apologize. It's a mailbag. If you made the show, great work by you. Uh, which typically, honestly, I think our hit rate here is about 80 to 90%. If you ask a question, you'll get an answer. Anyway, for what? At the moment, do you still foresee it will taking a quarterback at three? And depending on which quarterback they get, could you see them tailor the draft to whichever quarterback they draft? Thanks, as always. Uh, you're welcome. Yes, I see the Patriots taking a quarterback. No, I don't think they're going to tailor their draft class to that quarterback. Now, I understand why you ask. And I think it's actually not a boring question. I think it's it's a uh, a detailed one, uh, an important one. No one's really asking it. But if you're taking a quarterback at three, he should project as someone who can play with any kind of offense or skill set of players, There's a set of skill positions around it. Obviously, want to accentuate his strengths, build the scheme around him, mitigate weaknesses. But at this point, he should be a special player. And the most obvious example, right, is Brady. Now, he's he's the ultimate outlier, six-round pick, seven-time Super Bowl winner. But you'll remember watching him. The death by a 1,000 cut short passing game, the run-heavy play-action-based passing game, the deep passing game with Randy Moss, Dante Solworth in 07 and then 09 and, and 10 to pivots to the two tight ends. He could play with everything. And so for the Patriots, you get a player like that who's adaptable, who has a well-rounded skill set, maybe Drake May, and then find the best talent available to you. Then you adapt the scheme to the collective skill set of the quarterback and the receivers. I get where you're coming from again, but you don't get to be this picky. You could be when you were building around Brady. What does he want? What does he need? If we just give that, he can carry us. Right now, you need as much talent as possible and bet and understand and expect your new quarterback to be able to adapt. Just get the best receivers and talent around that you can. Um, and I, look, they're, they're going to do that. So we're going to talk about LA Wolf more in a second. Uh, next question. My apologies if I mispronounce this. I get to apologize in this podcast. You do not. Uh, Mukalaki, again, sorry if I butchered that, is asking, quote, have the Patriots ever considered Big Mike? Mike Owenu, a left tackle. Uh, if he's so versatile and left tackle is a position of high need, why not try him there? And that side, he's getting left tackle money. Uh, that, of course, was my editorial you know, way of speaking there. Look, I think it's something that they will try. Gerard Mayo had probably his worst answer at the owner's meetings when it came to, hey, who's going to play left tackle? He says, oh, well, we got Chucks, uh, meaning Ch uh, Chukwumu Korvor. And, uh, well, I guess we'll see. He did mention Onwenu being exceptionally versatile. I think the left tackle money versus right tackle money is something that's overblown at this point. Everyone needs to pass protect. Like you look at the money that guards got, uh, even putting Michael money aside. We had a, a guard and a Dickerson get over $20 million from the Eagles. The Rams paid two guards $16 million a year or more. So everyone needs to pass protect. But the bottom line is if Michael money is playing left tackle week one, I think the Patriots are in a bad spot. And it's because he's never played there before in the NFL. And this is a guy who was a career right guard in college. He did play a little bit left guard in 2021, but then Ted Karras took his job and Big Mike sat on the big bench for pretty much the rest of the season. So what I would prefer if I'm the Patriots is just to keep the player who can play right guard or right tackle seamlessly on that side of the line. Let him develop, ideally, chemistry with City Sal and move forward for the next three, four years with both of them at those positions. Big, strong players. And my rookie or some other player probably not on the roster to fill in a left tackle. And that sounds like an answer just as bad as Gerard Mayo's. But I don't think Mike Unwenu, who can play left guard, he can play right guard, he can play right tackle, we should just assume complete left tackle. I think it's wise to maybe give it a shot, but they're going to draft a player there. And ideally that player fits. If Mike Unwenu starting instead, that means that kid got hurt or he's not playing well at all. Matt Ryan, not the Matt Ryan, probably. Uh, is asking, quote, say we take a quarterback three and there are still a lack of weapons to move up from number 34 in the second round and target Brian Thomas, what would a package look like to move into the first round from 34 and acquire him? Also, I see uh, Xavier Leggett a lot, but I don't trust his body of work. How would you sell me on him? Leggett is a South Carolina wide receiver, projected day two pick, 6'1", 4'3", speed, pretty rocked up. Um, I'm not as high on him to start with the second question as a lot of folks in Patriots media – he would be a fine third round pick to me. He's uh, a little tight, not overly impressed with his route running, something that can be worked on. He's great after the catch, but he's not good off of the line. And so some of that to a degree can be worked on. Uh, maybe he's a more of a gadget player early on and there's raw talent there, 
but this is the first season in which he saw more than 30 targets. And sometimes that says, you know, speaks loudest. Um, this isn't to say you can't have one year wonders at receiver. Look, uh, Brian Thomas, I think is another one, but like it to me, I'd be, I'd be fine. Third round, even if they move up from 68 in the third round, just not, just not a 34 for me. I want more explosive, uh, smoother athletes, you know, explosive in and out of breaks guys that just can get open immediately at that pick. But as far as Brian Thomas, I, I talked about this in the last couple episodes, really dove into it with uh, Danny Kelly and Danny Heifetz from the ringer. It's just really hard to get into the late teens and early twenties where the Patriots are like an ideal trade up is somewhere in the mid twenties to maybe even 30, because you're looking at your own picks this year. You have one in every single round and an extra in the sixth. Then you have every single pick next year in every single round. And no one really else on the roster that you could trade as an asset. So what you're giving up is at least to go, let's say it's the late teens, not 16, but you know, 17, 18, or 19 to get Brian Thomas, his LSU receiver, uh, 17 touchdowns, just big plays everywhere. You're giving up at least to go even from 34 to 18, second round value. So either you just straight up give uh, 34 and a future second and plus something else because the future pick is you know downgraded to whatever. Or something in the aggregate. So it could be number 34, a future third, uh, a fourth round pick, um, you know, and, and something else. And if you're one of those teams at 18, 19, say you're, you know, the Bengals or Jacksonville, are you really moving back from a place to get a top 20 player on your board, maybe top 15 for the 34th pick, a future third, uh, a couple of fourths, and just like more stuff like that? Probably not. It's just a hard sell because the Patriots have to completely mortgage their draft class and all of their draft capital to go get a player like that. And it's really tantalizing. I've been arguing for it. When you put pen to paper and go, okay, this is what it would cost on the, on the modern trade value chart, which is updated and based on recent trade history, 10, 15 years of every trade. This is how teams see their picks and value them. It, it's just the cost for him. The good news is, as great as Brian Thomas is, this is a very, 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 very deep receiver class. I think they can get a good player at 34. Um, all right. Two, three more. Mirror musings. <laughs> First of all, I said at the top of this, we're going to try to go quickly. I guess this is just quick for me <laughs> on the podcast. It never happens. Okay, mirror musings. Should the weaker 2025 quarterback class and the uh, Shadur Sanders rumors of pulling in Eli Manning make the Patriots think twice about waiting on a quarterback? Sanders, uh, I guess, is already planning 13 months ahead if he just doesn't want to go to the Chargers, but whomever's going to have the number one overall pick. I'm not going. I'll make a stink. First of all, I wouldn't doubt that. Just just knowing uh, the little that I do about Deion Sanders and how he handles his business. Deion, obviously, his father, the head coach of Colorado. Um, yes, look, the bottom line is I have been against the trade down talk all offseason. You have the third pick. Take a quarterback. This idea that a quarterback will suddenly spring up like Jaden Daniels, the ultimate exception, Heisman winner who set stats and produced them that no one had ever seen before. 4,000 yards passing, over 1,000 rushing, something like 40 combined touchdowns. Maybe it was 50. I don't know. My brain is mush. Don't bank on that happening again. It is going to be a weird quarterback class. Things do change. But even if you get the 10th pick next year, it is going to cost you an arm and a leg to get to three, and then you're not even sure to get the guy, which, again, no guarantees. I've accepted that. That's the reality. You should accept that as well. But at least if you miss at number three, it didn't also cost you multiple other picks, which you would have to throw in a trade in the future to get back up there for a player who might not be as good as Drake May or Jane Daniels. Take the quarterback. Keep it simple. Take the kid. Okay, Epri, quote, based on the handling of the coaching staff hires and free agency, what is your level of competence uh, in this personnel group? So I guess he's including the front office. Is a... Uh, Specific to the draft. So how confident am I the Patriots can nail this draft? Quote, it's hard to separate from past draft failures as many current personnel members played key roles in awful, awful drafts. Okay, level of confidence is tricky, right? Because we don't have a long track record of what Elliot Wolf looks like, what he prioritizes, what he believes in, what he wants as a GM. He's not even the GM right now. He's still director of scouting. He's the de facto GM, and he's going to take a collaborative process and all this. But I would say... My level of confidence is about average in any front office. First of all, because very few front offices have established that they are better at drafting than anybody else. Again, the draft is a casino. These are a series of bets on the prospects themselves, 
on the teams to get themselves to get the best out of these prospects in the fit in the future. No one knows how this is going to go. You're taking the odds as best you see them and trying to squeeze as much value. That said, Wolf pivoting from a role based system, right? Belichick goes, how can he fit into my system? That's how you graded the player. This is how you identify them. This is how you rank them on the draft board. Flip to a, we're going to organize our board based on where we think these prospects should be drafted, a value-based approach, not role. He's going to be a nickelback and he'll also work on special teams. And that adds this much value. No, he's a second round receiver. We put him right here. Okay. And then we'll parse it out with all the second round guys at receiver and other positions and organize our board accordingly. That gives me more hope because the Patriots cannot any longer. And this has been true actually for a couple of years. Get picky about talent. You could when you were building around Brady. We just need to fill in these roles. He's the engine. He's the driver. He's the everything on offense and, you know, for a winning organization. He didn't do everything. But as far as like, that's the biggest piece of the puzzle. He's in place. He's not going anywhere. I just need a little corner piece to fit in. That's the role I need. No, no, no. The Patriots need to paint a whole new picture, build a whole new puzzle, which is probably why I'm advocating for the quarterback, but also why I'm a little bit more encouraged that they're not seeking out or going to pass on bigger, more beautiful pieces or better talent because they don't fit. They need talent in the building. This is a bottom five roster just based on pure talent. Now they're prioritizing talent. That's organizing the board, not roles. So not to mention, this is a great draft for their needs, quarterback, offense, tackle, and receiver. So it's 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 really not based on the personnel staff, like you asked about. It's more circumstantial how this draft class is, is, is built and, and laid out based on the positions and the talent and what we know about Elliott Wolf and how they're going to organize that board, which again favors what they need. The supply should meet the demand. And I think they're going to take the obvious pick. They're going to play it by the board. And honestly, they could get away with exceptions in the past. And some of those exceptions hit. Sebastian Vollmer, all these guys, right? But the margin of error is gone now. You just need to get talent. Make the obvious pick. It's more likely to work out. And that's what you need. Just guys in the building who can play. Last one. Ryan, quote, if May is available and they pick him, who decides when he plays? Will it be Mayo or Elliot Wolf? It will be Drive Mayo. Drive Mayo as a head coach is in charge of playing time. We have heard from Elliot Wolf. They intend to play young. Is also part of the Packer way, the, the you know Green Bay's focus on roster building, their philosophy. Uh, Alex Van Pelt will have a big say on how the quarterback plays, the system, you know, play calling, all of that. Um, keep in mind, it could be Jay Daniels. It could be J.J. McCarthy, who, again, I, I would be very disappointed if he's a selection. I'm not ruling him out to the Patriots, but it will come down to Mayo, and he'll have conversations, I'm sure, with both. Once it's on the field, that's his domain. When we're in the offseason, that's up to Elliot Wolf. Okay. We did not go quickly with the mailbag, but I don't think you're disappointed. Uh, thank you for everyone who wrote in. Thank you to everyone who watched and listened. We will have a guest later on this week. We will have another mail fan segment. Don't forget to reach out to Gary Langley, who dropped links, and I retweeted them, uh, to his lake houses in Bridgeton, Maine. Lovely moose pond. Went there as a kid. Tremendous offer. You get, I believe it was 12% off if you reach out to Gary and want to stay in one of his two houses in Bridgeton in Denmark, Maine. Uh, mention the podcast, donate to Boston Children's Hospital. If you want to come on the show, we have someone booked already for this week. If you want to come on next week or the week after, please do. Ask me a mailbag question and show proof of donation, just a screenshot or an email or a forwarded email. And you've given at least $1 to Boston Children's Hospital. And speaking of which, uh, we have about nine days until Pats and Pints at Vitamin C Brewing. This is going to be a fantastic night. It's me. Fitzy, ex-players, Doug is going to be there. Jeff Howe is going to be there. Other Patriots writers, come hang out with us. 7 to 10 at Vitamin C, SEA Brewery in Weymouth. All of the money is going to go to Boston Children's Hospital. Tickets are $20 to get you in the door. Drink, listen, laugh, ask questions. Just come hang out with us. It's 7 to 10 at Vitamin C Brewery in Weymouth, Massachusetts, Thursday, April 18th. Thursday, April 18th, 7 to 10 in Weymouth. Go to eventbrite.com or just Google Pat and Pints. Find Fitzy's Twitter. I'm about to tweet this out again here today. All the money to a great cause. Football, beer, one week from the draft. It's going to be a great night. Okay, that's it for me. Uh, I need to drink water and to go ask some players some questions. So, see you later this week. <laughs>